Merida is one of the most unique princesses that Disney has ever created. She's an inspiring leader, a skilled warrior in close quarter and ranged combat. Not to mention, she does parkour. Granted, we saw Mulan display this exact skill set 14 years earlier, but unlike Merida, Mulan was an adaptation of a much older story and a commoner. Merida is a completely original character who, in the words of the director Mark Andrews, was designed to break everything we know about what a princess is supposed to be. Instead of telling us a story about a helpless pretty young thang's quest for true love, we follow Merida's strained relationship with her mother and the nearly impossible mission of gaining her approval. <laughs> <laughs> which takes us on a series of misadventures involving witches, wisps, and animorphs who forgot how to morph back. Considering how untraditional she is, it probably won't surprise you to hear that her story was not based on a fairy tale or myth. And it's even less surprising when you factor in that this isn't just a Disney movie, it's a Pixar movie. Since the early days, Pixar has been writing their own fairy tales that reflect the many struggles of life. Embracing change, defying the naysayers to make your wildest dreams come true, recycling, but they still have to get their inspiration from somewhere. In the case of Brave, Pixar flew its directors, writers, and animators all the way to Scotland to soak up every bit of the culture that they could, from the landscape, to the architecture, to the food, to the folklore, and they fit every bit possible into the film. While we're on the subject, I'm actually putting together a similar trip myself for 2024, and the best part is, you fellow folklore and mythology fanatics get to join me. If you look in the description below, you'll see a link to a a survey on Trova Trip where you can tell me where you want to go, what you want to do there, and what your budget would be for a trip like this. Whether you want to eat haggis in Scotland like the Pixar team, go to a Dionysian wine tasting in Greece, or check out the Colosseum in Rome, we can make it happen. This is an amazing opportunity for our community to be fully immersed in cultures that we've only been able to explore in stories so far. It's also exclusive to our community, so you know that everyone joining shares the same passion and appreciation for this stuff as you. Again, just hit that Trova Trip link in the description to tell me all about your dream vacation abroad. And if you have any questions, I'll be doing a Q&A on my Instagram next week. And now, before we dive into the messed up origins of Brave, I wanna shout out the sponsor who made this episode possible possible honey. Have you ever been shopping online, having a ball of a time, filling up your cart with hand-carved bear sculptures, and then when you get to check out, you see the grand total you've racked up and think, well, that sucks. Well, today's sponsor, PayPal Honey, is here to help with that. Honey is the number one shopping tool in America, and that's because it saves shoppers money every single day by scouring the farthest reaches of the internet for promo codes. It's really simple to use, too. All you have to do is add it to your browser for free. Yes, for free, which you can do in a measly two mouse clicks. And next time you go on a shopping spree, Honey will automatically find you the biggest discount possible. I've personally been using Honey for years, now, but let me tell you, it's been especially helpful with the recent move between furnishing the new place and buying tools for all our new DIY projects. Lucky for us, Honey works with 30,000 stores, so there are promo codes for basically everything. Shoes, video games, kitchenware, even hand-carved bear statues. Think of it this way, by not using Honey, you're choosing to pay a higher price than you have to, and you deserve better than that and so does your wallet. So if you wanna start saving money today, you can either go to joinhoney.com slash John Solo or hit the link in the description. That's joinhoney.com slash John Solo or hit the link in the description. So a lot of the time when doing these comparisons, I like to start with a real quick summary of the movie before diving into the original story. But in this case, there is no original story, so I'm gonna do things a bit differently. I'm still gonna summarize the movie, but as I go through it, I'm going to point out the elements that have a basis in folklore, mythology, and history. There's quite a lot, so I'm probably gonna miss some things, but usually when that happens, one of you writes a whole essay in the comments to pick up my slack, so I'm not too worried. Now, as mentioned in the intro, this movie follows a Scottish princess named Merida who has no interest in being a conventional princess. Despite this, her mother, Queen Eleanor, is constantly trying to course correct her and points out every little micro expression of Merida's that may not be considered princess-like. So this portrayal of what's expected from a queen and princess may or may not be accurate to medieval Scotland 
It's hard to say for sure because we don't actually know very much about the role royal women played at that time. Because of that, I have to believe the writers based those expectations on more modern conceptions of princesses and queens, where there are strict rules to follow to ensure they're always seen as pristine and perfect. Above all, a princess strives for, well, perfection. At the same time, by striving for perfection and complete control, Eleanor successfully acts as the counterweight to her more emotional, passion-driven husband. And when the men start losing their wits to the frenzy of battle, only she is able to rein them in. She actually reminds me a lot of Agnes Randolph, the Countess of Dunbar. There's a famous legend about her defending Dunbar Castle from a siege by the English during the 1330s while their husband and the majority of their guard were away. In true Eleanor fashion, she didn't pick up a sword herself, but she was a proper leader. When the English used their catapults to launch boulders at the castle, she messed with their heads by ordering her servant women to use their kerchiefs to simply dust off the damaged ramparts. Then, when the English rolled up with a siege structure called a sow, which would allow them to easily climb over the castle, castle walls, she cleverly ordered her remaining guards to roll one of the larger boulders that had previously been thrown at them back over the wall, demolishing the sow in the process. So there may actually be some truth to what Eleanor is saying, but that doesn't make Merida's perspective any less valid. Maintaining a cool head when no one else can is an important skill no matter who you are, but as we see in the movie, so are the more practical attributes of Merida's. Whether she's riding a horse, shooting a bow, catching a fish, or doing parkour. Speaking of, during one of Merida's brief breaks from her princess responsibilities, she heads out on her horse and explores the countryside. Specifically, we see a lot of her in the highlands. This area in general is a beautiful recreation of Scotland's mountains, moorlands, and moss. But that waterfall she drinks out of was actually inspired by Horsetail Falls in Yosemite Valley, which glows orange and appears to be on fire during sunset. When Merida gets back from her solo adventure, her family's having dinner and her brother's have haggis on their plate. Haggis is a ball of ground up sheep organs mixed with various spices and wrapped in a sheep's stomach. It sounds pretty disgusting, but apparently it's delicious and is officially dubbed the national dish of Scotland. It's at this dinner that Merida learns the three other clans in the kingdom are sailing to Dunbrock to present their suitors for her hand in marriage, and after arriving, they compete in a series of contests called the Highland Games. The Highland Games are a real Scottish tradition that continues to this day. Every year, the most athletic Scots compete in a variety of contests that include foot races, tug of war, stone throwing, hammer throwing, straw throwing, and caber tossing, which is a synonym for throwing. But the arts are celebrated too, from bagpipes to dancing. It's difficult to determine when the Highland Games first originated, but the modern Highland Games took shape in the 18th century as part of an effort to re-establish Scottish traditions that were nearly lost after the Dress Act of 1746. Believe it or not, there was a time where the great British Parliament made it illegal to wear plaid, kilts, shoulder belts, basically anything that would be considered Highland garb, and this suppression of Scottish culture took a long-lasting toll. Some believe the games are older than that, though. There's supposedly records from the 11th century that describe an occasion where King Malcolm III organized a foot race up a mountain to find the fastest runner in the land to become his royal messenger. If true, it's possible that similar feats of athletic prowess were arranged to find the strongest, the most durable, the most brave... <laughs> He said it! He said it! Etc. And the Highland Games could be a spiritual successor to these contests. To be clear though, that is just a theory, and I couldn't find a scholarly source that backed up that story about King Malcolm III which has me thinking the games would not have been invented until after Merida's time. That's kind of a recurring theme with Disney movies though, especially in recent years. If they set their story in a certain culture, they want to include as many of its unique qualities as possible, and that often comes at the expense of chronological accuracy. Well, lucky for Merida, she gets to influence the competition for her hand, and so she challenges her potential husbands to an archery contest that she also competes in. Descendant of Clan Dumbrock, and I'll 
be shooting for my own hand. <gasps> Merida is successful in winning her own hand, but the victory is short-lived because her mom refuses to accept the result. And so after a heated argument, Merida flees into the forest on her horse. She's so wrapped up in her emotions that she doesn't pay attention to where she's going and ends up crash landing in a mysterious stone circle. The lore behind the circle has layers, okay? Two of them. First off, they were modeled off the Kalanish Standing Stones, which were erected in Scotland over 5,000 years ago and were an important site for ritual activity for at least 2,000 years, though archaeologists aren't certain on the specifics of what happened there. Secondly, these stones resemble a fairy ring, a naturally occurring phenomenon where mushrooms grow in near-perfect circles. Different cultures had their own unique superstitions about these circles. In Germany, they believed they were the site where witches danced on Walpurgis night, and the Dutch claim the circles were where the devil set his milk churn. Despite the variety of explanations, all cultures agreed on one thing, that entering a fairy circle was a bad idea, and the movie kind of insinuated this with Merida's horse. His animal instincts detected danger, and in a way, he was right, because after gathering her bearings, Merida notices a wisp off in the distance. In European folklore, a wisp, more formally known as a will-o'-the-wisp, is a glowing orb of light that appears in bogs, swamps, and marshes. Folk belief attributes wisps to ghosts, fairies, or some other kind of spirit, but in reality, it's just swamp gases getting ignited by static electricity. In the movie, Eleanor says the will of the wisp can lead you to your fate, and that's the purpose they serve in this story. I saw a wisp. A wisp? You know, some say that will of the wisps lead you to your fate. But in folklore, they have a much more sinister reputation, often fooling travelers into thinking their light comes from a lantern off in the distance. When the traveler walks in the light's direction, the static current they're generating pushes the light away so it looks like it's leading them. And this often leads to said traveler following the lights deeper into the wilderness and either getting lost or mistakenly stepping into deep water and drowning. Lucky for Merida, the wisps don't lead her to her death, but the path they take her on does cause a lot of trouble. She ends up at the humble abode of an old, cracked-out witch, and this witch gives Merida a cake enchanted with the power to change her fate. The directors of Brave have specifically stated that the witch isn't modeled off any particular character from folklore or any other Pixar movies. Wink, wink but she's simply an amalgam of witch stereotypes. She's old, she's ornery, she's ugly, she has a pet crow, and the solution she gives Merida isn't at all what was advertised. Okay, maybe it wasn't completely false advertising. All she really said was that it would change her fate, and that it did. When Merida fed the enchanted cake to her mother, the queen was transfigured into a bear. And this is where the two's relationship is really put to the test. You see, Merida's father, King Fergus, is an avid hunter of all animals, but bears are a creature he actually despises, likely due to his run-in with a particularly monstrous beast named Mordu, which resulted in the loss of his leg. Since that day, he's been eagerly waiting to avenge his loss, and has taken to sharpening his bear hunting skills by slaughtering every bear in his path. In reality, bears would have been extinct in Scotland long before Brave takes place, but the cause of their extinction is accurately captured by the film. That is, they were hunted until none remained. The time Eleanor spends in her bear form ends up being a bonding experience for her and Merida, and she's finally able to see the benefits of her daughter breaking tradition by developing her survival skills. Even still, she doesn't want to stay a bear forever, and the wisps once again appear to subtly steer her toward a cure. They lead Merida and Eleanor to some abandoned ruins, which turn out to be the former castle of their kingdom's founding fathers. Fun fact, in the original version of this scene, the women spotted a serpent tail as it disappeared into the lake. This tail, of course, belonged to Nessie, also known as the Loch Ness Monster. It's a cool little reference and one of the few components of Scottish culture that didn't make its way to the final cut of the film. But director Mark Andrews stated that including it simply raised too many interesting questions that they had no intention of answering. So that's why it was left on the cutting room floor. Anyway, while exploring the ruins, Merida realizes that the bear that took her father's leg, Mordu, was one of the four legendary brothers that her mother had told her stories about. When Mordu's father, the original King of Scotland, died, he split his one kingdom into four and gave a quadrant to each of his sons. But this was not appreciated by the oldest, 
who felt that it was his birthright to rule the country in its entirety. Just like Merida, he visited a witch who promised him a potion that would change his fate, but got more than he bargained for when he transformed into a bear. Unable to contain his rage and desire for power, Mordu embraced his new bear form and lashed out at not just his brothers, but their armies as well. And ultimately, he was forced into exile where he had lost the power to rule over the only subject that really mattered, his own mind. Now, The Legend of Mordu is a mostly original creation from the minds at Pixar, but the reason I say mostly original is because there are some details that appear to have been inspired by the story of King Eric Bloodaxe. No, names do not get more badass than that. I don't want to be John Solo anymore. I want to be Johnny Bloodaxe. Eric Bloodaxe, real name Eric Haraldson, is a complicated figure because historians don't know where his history ends and his mythology begins. There's historical records that detail the reign of Eric Haraldson when he was the King of Norway and the King of Northumbria in the mid-900s. But the Viking sagas, which are considered a mythologized or fantastical account of history, describe the rule of Eric Bloodaxe in Western Norway just a decade prior. Historians generally agree that Haraldson and Bloodaxe are the same dude, but Mordu definitely has more Bloodaxe vibes, which is fitting considering his family crest is a pair of crossed axes. So what's the deal with Bloodaxe? Well, according to the sagas, he was the son of King Harold Finehair, one of 20 sons to be precise. And while the legend states that Finehair ruled over a unified Norway, it still wasn't enough territory to evenly divide amongst that many. Eric was well aware of that fact, and so he systematically murdered every one of his brothers to secure his right to rule. It was probably these acts of fratricide that earned him his nickname. Interestingly, there's Latin texts that refer to him as fratris interfector, meaning brother killer. And so it's possible that the blood in blood axe could be a reference to his family. As you can see, just like Mordu, Eric betrayed his family to gain power. But there's another similarity I haven't yet mentioned. Neither king got to enjoy his rule for long because there was one brother whom Eric wasn't able to take out. Hakon, who had been brought up in England by a friend of their father, King Athelstan. Apparently, Eric was not a popular ruler and he knew it. So figuring that Hakon would have an easier time gaining supporters over himself, he actually ran away to England to take refuge with the very same King Athelstan that raised Hakon. Personally, I would like to think the two of them crossed paths during their voyages. I can just picture Hakon standing stoically at the helm of the ship ready to prove his right to rule, only to see his brother sailing in the opposite direction and maybe a little exchange happens. Brother, I intend to claim my birthright and sit on the throne as the rightful king of Norway. Consider your lands forfeit and your subjects mine to rule. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. They hate me over there anyway. I'm gonna go stay with Uncle Stan for a bit and see if he can get me a new gig. And Uncle Stan did. Because of his friendship with his father, Stan allowed Eric to be sub-king of Northumbria but he was eventually driven out of that job as well and killed in battle alongside five other kings. That's according to the sagas though. Modern scholars think his death was actually a bit quieter with him being assassinated while in exile. Either way, it sounds like neither he nor Mordu got a happy ending. In the film's epic finale, we get to see clans Dunbrock, Macintosh, MacGuffin, and Dingwall unite to end the monster's reign of terror but it's Queen Eleanor who deals the killing blow when she crushes him with a standing stone. This releases the soul of Mordu, or rather the man Mordu originally was, and he gives a nod of acknowledgement to Merida and her mother before disappearing into the ether. Then, after this unbelievable series of events, Queen Eleanor and Princess Merida finally understand each other. The bond between them is repaired and the queen is restored to her rightful form. I'm not crying, you're crying. So now you know the messed up origins of Brave. But for those who didn't already click away because you thought the video was over, I've got two more fun facts for you because you deserve them. First, the dogs we see throughout the film are Scottish deer hounds, which are authentic to the medieval period and were bred specifically to hunt the red deer. So King Fergus using them in his hunts is totally realistic, even though all the bears in Scotland would have been super dead by this point. Second, that seemingly nonsense language that the young MacGuffin speaks. If he was a wee bit closer, I could love a keeper at him, can is a real dialect known as Doric. I have no idea. 
Apparently, the actor who played him would send his mom the character's lines written in plain old English, and she would translate them to the incomprehensible but very real Scottish dialect. Just no fair marking his fact for the hunt of the queen. It, there's no one to nip it yet. Okay. Dog's gonna be shelled once we get to Northfield. What? So there you go. Two bonus facts, and all you had to do was wait four extra seconds. If that doesn't earn a like and subscription, I don't know what does. Maybe posting daily content about history, mythology, and folklore? Wait, I already do that. On YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Good boy. <laughs> That's my bubba. Feel free to check those out if you haven't yet. And also, I want to remind those interested in joining the Messed Up Origins field trip to follow that survey link in the description. I'll speak with you all again next week when I break down the very messed up origins of Gunther. Until then, my name is John Solo, and don't forget, John shot first.